Dibasic potassium phosphate, also known as dipotassium phosphate, potassium hydrogen phosphate, and several other names, is a salt made by the neutralization of phosphoric acid with potassium hydroxide. It's highly soluble in water and deliquesces. What does that mean? This is my bottle of potassium phosphate, and as you can see, I have it stored in a plastic bag. Inside that bag is a desiccant packet. A substance that is deliquescent is one that not only attracts and absorbs atmospheric moisture, but it does so to the point of dissolving in the moisture it attracts. Now that I have it open, you can also see that I've sealed the bottle with parafilm. Once we get that off, it's on there pretty good. You can see that when I open the bottle, the crystals are still free flowing and they survived well. Here's a watch glass with a few grams that I'm going to leave out in the open air for a few days and see what happens. In the meantime, let's talk about what dibasic means. Phosphoric acid is a triprotic acid, meaning that it has three hydrogen atoms that can dissociate and form hydronium ions in water. This is why it's an acid, really. One of the most fundamental chemistry lessons is that an acid plus a base makes a salt. This is a neutralization reaction. But here, you can see that when there's more than one acidic hydrogen, partial neutralization can occur. When there are two equivalents of potassium hydroxide, the second reaction happens, and we're left with the dibasic salt. Two hydrogen atoms were replaced with two potassium atoms. This also means that phosphoric acid has three different pKa values. The last hydrogen left on the dibasic salt isn't very acidic, so it has a rather high pKa of 12.37 versus the first hydrogens at 2.15. Of course, things get a little more complicated when the basic cation isn't in the plus one oxidation state, such as calcium or magnesium, but that's more than we need to talk about right now. Now, it is winter in Chicago, so the air is pretty dry around here. I have some humidifiers going, though, so there should be enough moisture to turn this small sample into a puddle of its former self. But after sitting out for nearly a week, it has gained no mass. In fact, it lost about a fifth of a gram. This should have told me right away what I was in for with this stuff, but it didn't. Here we go. As you might be able to tell from this nearly exhaustive list of uses for this stuff, there aren't many exciting ones. This is a fairly recent purchase, by my standards, and I can't for the life of me figure out why I bought it. I thought maybe it was for the enzyme purification experiment I wanted to try before I learned how expensive gel chromatography is, but that actually calls for a phosphate buffer using the tribasic salt. Just before I started editing this, though, I stumbled across this old video while I was looking for something else. Apparently, this was used in one of my first attempts at filming a chemistry experiment to make a pigment that we'll talk about in a few minutes. But first, I'm going to mix up a solution. I suppose a sort of buffer, technically. You can kind of see that the crystals have an almost pink tint to them. Anyway, I'm mixing up 100 milliliters of a 0.5 molar solution, which will give me 0 0.01 moles in 20 milliliters of this solution. While I mix this up, let me tell you about the only paper I found that uses potassium phosphate as a reagent. It was written way back in 1920 for the Journal of Biological Chemistry. In it, the author found that glucose could be oxidized by hydrogen peroxide, but only with dibasic phosphate present. He used the sodium salt, but mentioned that potassium was used successfully in other experiments. It was written in what I like to call early 20th century technical prose, so it was a little hard to follow at times. It isn't a particularly exciting experiment visually, so I won't repeat it here, but it was an important experiment to understand a metabolic process. I found another procedure in which capillary action is exploited to soak up a solution of potassium phosphate, and then as it evaporates, crystals grow and look like snow on the tree. <laughs> 
I even did a little art project with food coloring to color the crystals while they grow. Well, it didn't work out so well. This foreshadowing of disaster was a bit more clear. One of the things where I completely fail as a chemist is growing crystals. This was a complete and utter failure. I might revisit this at some other time though, if only to use up the potassium phosphate. It was a pretty cool effect, so getting it to work is a good way for this stuff to get used. I spent quite a lot of time researching uses, and most of them take advantage of the buffering effect, mostly in biochemistry, and I don't do a lot of biochemistry. So I can't see any reason for me to keep this in stock. They say practice makes perfect, so maybe it's time I start practicing the crystal growing art. For now though, after two or three weeks of this tree looking pretty much exactly like this, I gave up. The only other procedure I was able to find in a lab manual was one where dibasic potassium phosphate was used to qualitatively determine the presence of a plus two magnesium ion in solution. The procedure clearly stated to take a sample of the solution suspected of containing magnesium, I used a 0.1 molar solution of magnesium sulfate, add some six molar ammonia, well, I had five molar on hand so I used a little bit extra, and then add the potassium phosphate solution, and I used the 0.5 molar one I just made. Then boil in a water bath for a few minutes, and a gelatinous white precipitate would indicate magnesium. Well, I got a gelatinous white precipitate as soon as I added the ammonia, and I got the precipitate after boiling without the ammonia. So, I don't get any of this either. So let's get back to that 0.5 molar solution I made and a procedure I know will work. Here are three large test tubes and I'm going to add 20 milliliters of the 0.5 molar potassium phosphate solution to each with a volumetric pipette. It's a rather slow process, but at the end of it, each test tube will contain 0.01 moles of dibasic potassium phosphate. Here we go, all filled up. I happen to have one molar stock solutions of three cations that produce insoluble phosphates. The same cobalt chloride I used in that old video, copper 2 chloride and iron 3 chloride. I thought about using nickel 2 too, but I only have the sulfate and I arbitrarily decided I wanted to use only chlorides. So first up is the cobalt. I'm adding 10 milliliters of one molar solution, which is a one to one mole ratio in the hopes of avoiding making anything but cobalt hydrogen phosphate. I made this in that old video because cobalt phosphate is used as a pigment in things like oil paint. I'm somewhat interested in making a bunch of pigments to make my own paint, even though I'm artistically challenged, as evidenced by my construction paper Christmas tree. Next up is copper too. This produces a pale blue precipitate. So I went through quite a bit of careful weighing to make sure I was keeping a nice mole ratio, but you might notice that the cobalt solution is still a little pink and this copper solution stays a bit blue. Hmm, I sense some trouble. Fortunately, I did catch a small error before it became a big mistake. Since the iron is iron three, I'm adding another 10 milliliters of the potassium phosphate to keep the one to one mole ratio before I add the iron chloride. All right, now I can add the iron three chloride. I'm still adding 10 milliliters and now that's a perfect one to one ratio. We get a nice pale orange precipitate that's surprisingly fluffy. I'm gonna leave them all to settle for a little while and then filter off the precipitates. As fluffy as that iron precipitate is, you can see it settled right down. The other two are taking a little bit longer. This is also the point at which I noticed that the solutions still have a considerable color to them. I'm going to add a squirt more potassium phosphate, which is about a milliliter and a half, to each of the three test tubes and then give them each a good stir 
in the hopes that my one molar solutions were just a bit more than one molar. Unfortunately though, it doesn't appear as though that's the case. As I said before, things get a little more complicated when the cations are not in the plus one oxidation state, and everything gets more complicated when you start throwing transition metals into the mix. As luck would have it, none of these three cations form acidic phosphates. Nevertheless, I collected the solids. The iron was particularly painful to filter. You can probably tell there was some cross-pollination while the filter papers were drying, and I'm pretty sure that extra shot didn't take all the metal ions out of solution. For what it's worth, the cobalt was a quantitative yield, but I think it was biased a bit high with the copper migration. The copper was an 83% yield, and iron was, as I said, a pain to filter. There was quite a bit of loss, making the measured 23% yield not so surprising. Since I inadvertently picked two chemicals on the first draw out of the hat, the next video will feature sodium. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next time.